Hello and welcome to another world building episode where we're going to talk about creating aliens and fantasy creatures and plants. Like always, the advice I give is based on my own experiences. It's not all encompassing by any means. And it's just some things that I like to think about when I create creatures for my fantasy worlds or sci-fi worlds. So obviously feel free to agree or disagree or argue with me in the comments if you want or share your own views on anything that I talk about in this video. And I'm going to talk about both sentient and non-sentient creatures and a little bit about plants but not a whole lot about plants because I don't usually do much with those. So I'm doing this as one thing because creating aliens and fantasy creatures aren't all that different from each other so it's an area where I think that fantasy and sci-fi writers can learn a lot from each other. Perhaps especially fantasy writers can learn a lot from sci-fi in this area, uh, in my opinion. We'll get to that. The first question to ask, of course, is should you have different species in your fantasy or sci-fi? Um, do you need to go through all of this trouble to create these creatures? The answer, of course, is that you don't have to. There is excellent fantasy and sci-fi out there that doesn't have any other sentient creature than humans and all of the animals and plants are things that we recognize from our own world. So if you don't want to have it, you don't have to. So how do you decide if you should have different species in your story? And there's really only one question there. Do you want to? If yes, then go ahead. If no, then don't. And that might be controversial, but I actually think that if you want to add in some, some aliens or fantasy creatures into your story just because you think they're cool, that is an excellent reason to just put them in there. You don't need to have a more, I don't know, advanced, important reason than that. If you think they're cool, if you want to write about them, write about them. If, on the other hand, you feel like you should have fantasy creatures or aliens in your story just because it's fantasy or sci-fi, you really, really don't have to. In fact, there are stories that are more interesting because they only feature humans. I'm gonna take as an example, Firefly, the TV show. That is a lot more interesting because everyone is a human. There are no aliens. And there are also some stories where there are aliens that don't need to be there. The story could have been just as good or maybe even better without them. I'm not going to give you any examples of those. The point is, at the end of the day, of course, it is entirely up to you if you want to have fantasy creatures or aliens in your story. But since you're here, I'm assuming that you do want to. So the next question that I'm just going to do very shortly, how much effort should you put into these creatures? And of course the answer is as much as you need to. Because it depends on how big a role they play. If your aliens or fantasy creatures are only in the background of the story and they're not really important for the story, you don't need to put a lot of effort into them, but on the other hand, if they're only in the background, maybe you don't need them at all. But that's of course entirely up to you. But I'm going to assume that if you want to put aliens or fantasy creatures into your story, you want to put at least a little bit of effort and maybe you want to know where to put in the effort because it's a pretty big thing to create an entirely new species. And just to be clear, in this video I'm talking about biology and chemistry and like the physical attributes of the species, not so much about culture because I'm going to cover culture in a different video. Now I said earlier that fantasy authors can learn a lot from sci-fi about these things and what did I mean by that? I meant basically diversity because where fantasy stories often have humanoid uh, creatures like elves, dwarves, orcs, and so on, sci-fi has a lot more diversity there. And I will talk about these classic fantasy creatures in a bit because despite what I'm about to say, they might be just what the story needs. You don't have to do anything different than them. But for right now, I'm going to talk about different things. Because I think that sci-fi is often more interesting because they have creatures that looks like like slugs or insects they have a few extra limbs or they communicate telepathically or with color or scent or whatever and there is so much diversity there and it's absolutely amazing and that's going to be one of my first tips don't get hung up on your aliens or fantasy creatures having to look humanoid because in our world yes apparently this was the best way for us to evolve but it wasn't the only option and you can look at any creature in our world, any animal, and look at them and just see what would they look like if they were sentient. And I'm talking about sentient creatures here. Animals, I will talk about a little later. 
And to be clear with this, I am not talking about like taking a lion and giving it a human torso and creating some sort of lion centaur. Uh, that is a thing you can do, but it's not the only way to create a new creature. And in my opinion, it's not very original. That said, being original is difficult and it also absolutely does not have to be your goal. But if it is, if you have a goal to be original, just a little original or entirely, there's a span there. There are places where you can find inspiration and usually I turn to nature or literature. So if we start with nature, because I already touched on nature, look at any animal in nature or any plant or other entity and consider what they would look like if they were sentient. And just a brief note on sentience, there is no ironclad definition and I don't want to get into philosophy, so I'm not going to give a definition of sentience. So you can define it however you want, but I think what I'm about to say is going to be relevant regardless of how you define it. One of the first questions I ask is how do they communicate? Is it through sounds or sense or telepathy or uh, visually, or is it through an entirely new and different kind of sense? I don't usually do a new and different kind of sense because I think that is very, very difficult to make um, clear and consistent. So I try to avoid that, but if it's a thing you want to try, go ahead and try. And also to be clear about this, I am talking about the basic ways to communicate. If you do it via sound like we do, or some sort of sign language or uh, smell or whatever, I'm, specific languages is not what I'm talking about because again, I'm gonna cover that in a different video. <laughs> Also, another thing to consider is that a sentient life form does not necessarily need to have digits or opposable thumbs. Um, if you want them to be able to create things, to create tools and build houses or invent space travel, they do need some way to hold things and manipulate things, but that doesn't have to be hands and fingers. It can also be telekinesis or some sort of tentacles or anything, really. Uh, you can make up your mind about that, but doesn't need to be hands, can of course be, but yeah. I also want to say that a race doesn't have to be able to build tools to be sentient. You can really just look at all the sentient dragons in fantasy literature because they can think and talk and all of that, but those claws could generally not build a house. And speaking of hands and ways to create tools or not create tools, the physiology of your creatures can vary vastly from humans. And again, I think this is something that uh, science fiction does really, really well when they explore different kinds of aliens. When they have aliens that can change their gender at will, or it changes throughout their lives, or they only have one gender or like 15 different ones and things like that. And aliens that see time differently from humans, where either they experience time faster or slower, or maybe they don't even see time linearly like we do. And a lot of things like that, that is very interesting and sometimes also very, very complicated to explore. But again, it's something that I like to think about at least when I create a new species. So anyway, that was nature, how to take inspiration from nature when you're creating your species. Let's talk about literature now. And with literature, I do not necessarily mean reading other fantasy and science fiction and taking inspiration from their creatures. That is one way to do it, is an excellent way to do it, but I also think that that is a very obvious way to do it, so I'm not really gonna talk about it. I'm gonna talk mostly about myths and science. So myths first, there are thousands upon thousands of strange creatures in different mythologies from our world. So you can find something in Greek mythology or Chinese folklore or old Celtic folklore or any folklore really from any area of the world uh, because they usually have some very very interesting and unique creatures that you can build upon. Because a lot of people have among their gods or demons or whatever really weird and really amazing kind of creatures that maybe you can't use exactly as they are, especially if you want to be somewhat scientific about it, but still, inspiration. Just, of course, when you're taking something from a real culture, be a little bit careful. You might not want to take one culture's kindest and most nurturing god and turn them into the big bad of your book, because that might not go over very well. But how about the option of being very scientific about it? There are many, many, many books and articles and YouTube videos and everything else where scientists speculate about what aliens might look like. That is a great place to start and you can really just google what might alien life look like and you will have research material for days. 
I, for example, I have this book, The Search of Life for the Universe, uh, which I got for a university course that I took a few years ago that was about um, life in the universe and where it might evolve and how it might evolve. So that book, for example, is full of scientific explorations of what could alien life look like if it evolved on a neutron star or in this kind of climate or on this kind of star or asteroid or whatever. And that is really, really fascinating and a great place to look not only for inspiration for your aliens, but also actually fantasy creatures. With fantasy creatures, of course, you can't just take an alien that would have evolved on our sun and put it on Earth or an Earth-like planet, but you can still look at it and see how many different ways there are to think about life. So those are some places you can look if you want to create something new and unique. But now let's talk for a little bit about the classic fantasy creatures, you know, elves and dwarves and orcs and not hobbits for some reason, because no one wants to write about the hobbits. But anyway, I've talked about being original and the new and unique, but is there a reason not to write about these classic creatures? I mean, the answer is no, not really. If you want to write about those, you write about those. In some stories, that is what you need. In some of my stories, I need creatures that people are already somewhat familiar with for the story to work. And so why not use them? Personally, though, I do like when authors have at least somewhat of a unique spin on things. So what is a ways of doing that? Well, one way is to just give them a new name, call your elves Nios, but have them behave and look more or less exactly like elves. Personally, I think that this is a kind of lazy and kind of cheap way to try to be unique. It kind of annoys me and it could annoy me enough that I would put a book down. I've, I've done that actually. I much prefer the approach to still call them what they are, but make them a little bit different from everyone else's elves or whichever creature you're basing them on. So where a classical elf is untouched by age, they're tall and beautiful and they love art and singing and they live in forests, maybe change just one of these things and I'm a lot more interested. And that's even if you're only making them short instead of tall or you give them a limited lifespan, even if that lifespan is pretty long, a few hundred years. Of course, some people will say that this is a cheap trick too. I have heard people say that this is worse than just giving them a new name. Uh, That's just up to preference. And this is just, this is my opinion. This is where I stand in this debate. Now there is of course a danger in changing them too much. Because if you're writing about an elf, everyone immediately gets an image in their mind. It might be a little bit different for everyone, but everyone will see something. They will be familiar with what an elf is in their mind. If you then tell us that elves are short instead of tall, we'll just, we'll just adjust the image. If you tell us that they are nomadic rather than living in the woods, okay, that's fine. If you also tell us that they are scientists and they are always at the forefront of whatever the latest technology is in your fantasy world, I will start raising my eyebrows a little bit, but if it's done well, I can accept that too. But then if you also tell me that their lifespan is roughly 100, 150 years or so, around that point I will start to wonder why you're even calling them elves anymore. It can still work, of course. Subverting people's expectations like that is uh, sometimes very effective, but I think it's difficult and there is a danger to trying to subvert people's expectations too much. So personally, these creatures that I've just described, I would just give them a different name. And that is actually one way that I have created my own fantasy creatures. I have started from an elf or an orc or something, and I've changed them so much that they basically have nothing to do with the original creature anymore. And I've just changed their name. And usually people can't tell where I've gotten them from. That said, I got into new and unique again. I am very sorry. Let's let's go back to the classic ones. Because if you're going with a normal fantasy race and you're not changing anything significant about them, you do still need to consider how they fit into your world. Your elves might not be able to look exactly like Tolkien's elves because your world is not Tolkien's world. I mean, they can still be incredibly similar, but you have to figure out why. Do your elves like singing? Why do they like singing? Tolkien's elves like singing because that is at the very core of their mythology. That is how the world was created. Singing was the first uh, way to communicate. So 
that makes a lot of sense. And you don't have to create the entire mythology, obviously, to figure out why your elves like singing. But it's still something to consider, it's still something to think about why they have this specific uh, trait or physical attribute or whatever it is. And of course, again, I will get to culture later, but I do want to say that both in culture and physical appearance, make sure that there is some sort of diversity. Find the elf that is tone deaf, or the dwarf that loves the sun and the forest, or the orc that would much rather be a farmer than a warrior. Because where a lot of authors go wrong is, of course, where they're elves or dwarves or orcs or whatever, they all have exactly the same personality, they like exactly the same thing, they look more or less exactly the same, and they have the same opinions and all of that. And that is, of course, incredibly unrealistic because no species could evolve without diversity. And speaking about evolving, of course, evolution is not something that you have to bother with. How did this creature come from being a one-celled organism to this. Don't bother with that, and obviously if you're writing a fantasy, the gods probably just created them that way. However, within the story, within the world that you have created, these creatures still do need to make some sort of sense. Why did this weird thing about your fantasy creatures not get bred away? Why is it an advantage instead of a disadvantage? And that is even if the gods created them, the gods must have had a reason, and I mean, that could be just a sense of humor and just, I'm gonna give them this useless thing and see what they do with it. But either make it like that, make sure that that is in your god's personality to do, or make sure that this weird thing does make sense. As an example, if your creatures can't hear, why can they not hear and how do they detect danger? Do they have eyes in every direction to see danger and extremely good night vision? Or maybe there is no night on this planet at all because it has so many suns, there's always a sun up. And communicating, how does that work? Is it by touch? But in that case, how do they communicate over distance? Is it a sign language or is it a scent or telepathy or whatever? So whatever the new and unique feature you might have given to your creatures, make sure that that's a thing that could conceivably have evolved that way, that there is a purpose for it. And this might of course be a reason to go with the classic creatures, because when I read something where there is a new and interesting uh, and unique alien or fantasy creature, I will start asking these questions. Not every reader will, but I will. But if I'm reading about an elf or an orc, I will just sort of accept that this is what they're like and I don't really care why including actually the singing that I mentioned before. If your elves just like singing, I will probably not ask you why unless something else in your world building makes that not make sense. Either way, like I said, your creatures must make sense in the world that you have created, and that includes the geography. Uh, in the last video for this series, I created a fantasy map, and this is where you want to go back to your fantasy map and look at your geography and see what you need to take into consideration there. Because of course it matters where your species lives, it matters if they live on land or in water, or where there isn't a lot of water so they need a way to create or find water or something like that. It also matters where on the globe they live, if they live near the equator they probably handle the scorching heat and the sun very very well, but if they have a reason to go to the south or to the north and find snow and winter, they're probably not handling that very well. Which can be an interesting thing in your story, if that is the kind of story you're writing. It also matters if your creatures live above or below ground, because the species that lives below ground and don't see a lot of sunlight, they're probably gonna have fairly pale skin, and they're probably gonna uh, see very well in the dark, and they're probably not gonna handle sunlight very well at all, might not go out during the day. So that's something to consider, maybe if you want to make your dwarves a little more unique. Now let's move on to creating non-sentient creatures. This is if you want to create animals in your fantasy or sci-fi. In a way, the process is very similar to sentient creatures. Basically look at mythology or nature or literature or wherever and uh, see what you can do with that. One way to do it, to make something unique, is to look at two animals, two very different animals, and look at both their physical appearance and attributes, either attributes that this animal has or attributes that humans have given to these animals, and see how you can combine them. What could you take, for example, from a snake and a fox? What would you combine and what kind of creature would you create from that? Actually, let me know in the comments because this could be interesting. I'm gonna put my own version in the comments as well. I haven't actually created this creature yet, so hopefully I'm gonna figure something out. But yeah, let's see. 
Now, the most important things to consider when you're creating a new animal is how do they find food? How do they reproduce? And where are they on the food chain? Who are their natural predators? Who are their prey? Or are they herbivores? Do they not have prey? How do they defend themselves against predators if they need to? Or how do they kill their prey? Do they have poison or sharp fangs or claws? Or do they defend themselves by running away or playing dead or by fighting back? There's a lot of things there. And of course, just like with sentient creatures, make sure that they make sense within the geography. If they live around the equator and they have thick fur, you need to figure out why they have that and how they keep cool, for example. And here's the thing, again, very much a matter of opinion, but again, I prefer that you call a horse a horse and a dog a dog. If you have an animal in your story that basically behaves exactly like a dog, why are you not calling it a dog? What exactly justifies that you have created a new creature if it's basically a dog? Or for example, if you have some kind of lizard that people use basically as a horse, make sure that it's a little bit different. Still good for pulling carriages or riding on, but make sure that you couldn't just take the lizard and put a horse there instead and nothing would change in the story. For example, one difference could be that these lizards, they behave pretty much like horses, but they have uh, very sharp, long, or strong claws that makes them able to climb very steep hills then that's perfect. A horse could no longer do exactly that job. Or they are pretty much like horses, except when the sun is too bright, they will go to sleep because they're lizards. That's what they do, right? Because they're cold-blooded and they want to soak in the sunlight or something. Either way, maybe now a horse could do that job better, but at least they're not exactly the same thing. And also make sure that these differences, of course, matter in the book, in the story. Your characters need to ride up the steep cliff for some reason, or they're in a hurry to get somewhere, but they have to stop for two hours in the middle of the day because the lizards are sleeping. Either way, just make sure that it impacts the story in some way. And now let's talk briefly about plants. First of all, do you make your own plants? Um, I would for a sci-fi, unless the planet I was writing about was terraformed and everything comes from Earth. For fantasy planets, some people do this, usually because they need something specific. They need a poison or an antidote or a flower that means something specific or a tree that can be used for something specific that we don't really have on Earth or that they don't know about on Earth. These are all good reasons to create a new plant. I have created a new plant just because I needed a flower that rhymed with a certain name when someone was going to write a love poem. I was too lazy to figure out how to write the poem in a different way, so I just made up a word and then I made some notes about that flower. And that was a great reason to create a new flower. Of course, just a couple of things about this, again, needs to make sense in the geography. If it grows in the desert, you can't have a flower that would need a lot of water. If it grows in a dense forest, you can't have something that would need a lot of sunlight. I don't know a whole lot about this because, again, I don't usually create uh, new plants, at least not in a way that I need to think about all of these things. But at least one very simple rule of thumb is that if it's a dry climate, your plant needs a way to store a lot of water. Think succulents and things like that with like thick leaves. Thick leaves. They might also have very shallow but very long roots because that way they can gather up more water uh, quicker before it evaporates. Because if it's raining and then the sun is very, very hot, uh, the water won't sink into the earth. It'll evaporate if the plants haven't managed to grab it first. And with that comes the fact that plants or trees with very shallow root systems are very sensitive to wind because they're not deeply rooted, they don't have a good grasp of the earth. And so if a strong wind comes, uh, they will fall over. And this doesn't have to be in the desert. In fact, in the desert, there's not a whole lot of trees, but it can also be you have a very rocky uh, area with not a lot of soil. Uh, there are still trees that can live there. Pine trees can live on almost no soil at all, uh, but they do fall over if there's a storm. Not guaranteed, but if there's a storm and trees have fallen over, at least here in Sweden, they're usually the pine trees have fallen over first and then maybe some other trees if the wind has been strong enough, basically. And this is the very easiest thing to do. Look around you, look at your map, look at where in the world 
Uh, does this take place? Where does this plant live? What kind of plants live there in our world in that kind of climate? And make a plant that would fit in with those but just has the special flower or the special uh, poisoner antidote or whatever that you need for the story. Generally speaking though, again, I did say that these were good reasons to create new plants, but personally I tend to avoid creating new plants uh, for poison or antidote reasons, because I feel like there is a very big chance of uh, it seeming too convenient that there is something that works just like this toxin you need or the antidote you need or something like that right then and there. Of course this depends on how it's written, but for simplicity's sake, because I don't want to figure out how to write it well, I try to just avoid it. So those were some thoughts on creating new species of sentient creatures and non-sentient creatures and plants. If you have any questions or opinions or your own advice to share, please do that in the comments below. Also give this video a thumbs up if it was helpful to you. The next video in the series is going to be a workshop where I talk about these things and I create some plants and some uh, species uh, just to show you how I actually do things practically speaking. So if you feel like you didn't quite understand what I meant with some of these things, A, of course, ask below, but also keep an eye out for that next video because things are going to be clearer after that, I think. And of course, don't forget to subscribe because there are many, many more world building videos coming your way. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.